some participants suggested that maybe I should tie med consciousness with meditation so that, in other words, relate consciousness to meditation and that would help people in understand why we have to meditate the why, the where, the how and all that instead of just theoretically philosophically talking on consciousness so this is what I'm going to do I'm going to talk about meditation uh, in relation to consciousness, to the mind so that's meditation I've got in here and I have half an hour to do it before the, the bell goes and um, we try to link what we have learned for all these years into the subject of, into various subjects actually. Conscious, consciousness, it, it relates to so many subjects. Meditation relates to so many subjects. Uh, for example, to the power of prayer, because meditation is about the mind. So the power of prayer, when we, when we say our prayer, where does the power come from? The power of prayer and for example, the, the, the secret law of faith. How can faith make a difference um, in you, when you're carrying out something, in your meditation, in your speech, in your work? How come faith makes a lot of difference? There's a secret, we, some people call it the secret law of faith. So it all relates to the mind. And also the, uh, the miraculous law of healing. Um, how come some people get healed mentally? Uh, they have a sickness and then they go through this men, you know, uh, meditation and all of a sudden they find that the, the, the sickness is all healed. So that's the miraculous law of healing. And, and of course, in um, meditation and in prayer, uh, when you're doing that with faith, protection arises. The dynamic law of protection protects not just of the body, of your mind. Protect you from committing bad deeds. So protection is very important. Uh, and also, uh, when you have the power of prayers, faith, healing and protection, then it comes up with the mysterious law of inner guidance. How come people seem to have, an, have a guardian angel in, inside their mind guiding them as to what to do. So all this, um, what we will talk about in meditation with regard to consciousness and also the, um, 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 the mighty law of, of, of courage. Some people are very courageous in doing things and that's what, what the mind brings the courage into power. And of course we will talk about security and the magical law of, of mental nutrition. It, it, meditation is a nutrition, it's a mental nutrition and also it's a very positive way of emotional control, emotional control. So all these we'll talk about when we're doing meditation and when we're talking about meditation and consciousness. And of course, ultimately, what's, more impo what's the most important? The ultimate law of infinite life. And we call it nirvana. We call it Buddhahood. And that's, that's very important. So, that's, we'll talk about all these in relation to uh, consciousness. So meditation, we'll start from, maybe it's time to do a review. We start from grade one. We start, if we, we start from grade one. Why, why what, what are the benefits? People always talk about when, in the temporal world, we always consider when we are doing something, do we get any benefits, benefits from it? Benefits mentally, bodily, they always want to, for, especially for beginners. And this is good for you to understand, not just res in, with respect to yourself, uh, it also helps you to understand and helps you to, to talk about it when you want to introduce meditation to other people. So what, do you, what are the object, what are the the benefits of doing it. People like to consider the benefits, the pros of, of doing meditation. Uh, but let's, let's talk about it briefly for a few minutes. The benefits of meditation, um, if we can generalize it, is into the present benefit and the future benefits. Not just of the present benefits, it also involves future benefits. 
present benefits is with regard to temporal benefits, worldly benefits, like it, it benefits you in this life. But we understand that when, when, when the Buddha looked at the, the time dimensions, it's not just of the present life, it's of the future life too. The time dimension is, is past, present, and future. We can change the past. Can we change the past? We can. Uh, we don't have to agonize on the past because you can change it. Why do you have to feel so regretful? Why do you have to agonize yourself by thinking about it, hanging on to it, attaching to it, until you become grief-stricken, you become very sad, you become depressed? The past is gone. Throw it away. Don't always bring the garbage of the past back onto your table, think about it, ponder on it, and then grief-stricken on it. Cry, yell, you know, you don't have to, so the past. The present, you gotta work at the present. It's the present moment that counts. The future, if the present is good, the future will look after itself. So let's consider the present temporal benefits of meditation. Well, so many temporal benefits, I can only generalize. Uh, I would have, I thought I would miss out a lot, but these are the important points. To reduce stress, people have work stress, stress in the family, stress at school and university, stress. Stress in, in a peer group, in the company, in what they're working, where they're working, to reduce stress. And, and then also to free oneself from symptoms and emotion, emotions such as depression, fear, worry, jealousy, anger, uh, um, you name it, anxiety, uh, shamelessness. Uh, you, lots of these symptoms and emotions. Um, we'll talk about all these symptoms and emotions in details when we talk about consciousness. But we know that if you, the present benefit, the temporal benefits of meditation is to free yourself from the symptom, from, from all these symptoms and emotions. Quite a few people, they don't even know they, they, have, they have these symptoms. They don't even know they have this kind of emotions. When emotions come, they just express it. They don't know why. They just, so that's the reason why they suffer. When emotions come, they're being involved. They, they, they're being swallowed up by the emotions and they just suffer from them. But let's analyze them. Find out why. Why, do you, why are you emotional? How do you have emotional control? How do you control your emotions accordingly? That's very important. Next, to increase confidence and happiness. Uh, we're always talking about in North America, confidence is very important. You must be confident of what you're doing. You must have faith in what you're doing. Confidence. Uh, if you don't have confidence, then you have a lot of inferiority complex. So confidence. If you can control emotionally yourself, you have confidence, you, you can reduce your stress, and when the stress is reduced, you're happier than before. So ha to increase confidence and happiness, Next is to reduce the desires for sensual pleasures. This is quite controversial. Some people may think that it's good to have sensual pleasures. I'm always in pursuit of satisfying my sensual pleasures. If I, if I want to smoke, I smoke. If I, I want to drink, I drink. If I want to involve in a, in, a, in a relationship with an opposite sex, I can do it whenever I want, whatever I want, as long as I can satisfy my sensual pleasures. Now, meditation would help you to identify the essential pleasures with a view to control it. And essential pleasures would have a lot of detrimental effects to you, which you may not, uh, may not have thought about. The essential pleasures of liquor drinking, for example. How many people get killed on the road because of drunken driving? Thousands of them got killed because of your sensual pleasure of pursuing that alcoholic content in the drinks. What happened after you're drunk? See, to reduce the desire for sensual pleasures, what happened to 
people who are always in pursuit of relationships. Broken families, broken marriages, disease. Lots of these things happen. To increase wisdom and tranquility of mind when you are doing meditation all the time, your wisdom level will increase. Remember, there's a difference between wisdom and intelligence. Um, wisdom is prajna. Prajna. Intelligence is temporal. So in other words, the most intelligent scientist who invented the most intelligent technology could use the technology to, to kill people, to occupy another country, to gain reputation and fame and wealth. He's absolutely intelligent, but he has no wisdom because he's destroying humanity. Atomic bomb, hydrogen bomb, you name them. So, increased wisdom is very important, and tranquility of mind. Think about all these temporal benefits. Do they deserve your coming to learn meditation? Do they deserve your practice of meditation every day? How much time do you assign to meditation every day? Half an hour? 15 minutes? Or one hour? Considering the, the kind of benefits you can obtain, you can acquire, why don't you spend more time into it? Why don't you make it a system that you have to do it and consistently train your meditation so that you can gain these benefits? As I always mention, how much time you spend on your, on your iPod, on your iPad? How much time you spend on your, te the, and your, on your cell phone? You could spend two, three hours on your cell phone. You, you count the, the amount of time you spend on your cell phone, your computer, your iPad, for fun, or just for telling, just for talking to various friends, you know, and you won't have half an hour for meditation, which would bring you all these present temporal benefits. People are like that. This is something that requires training. You think this benefit will just come to you instantly? This benefit is gradually, these are gradually coming to you. Not just in one sitting, the benefit will come to you. As a matter of fact, you realize tranquility of mind in one setting. You realize you're more joy, joyous in one setting. You realize that your, your mind is more peaceful in one setting. But you gain more and more by systematically assigning time to do it every day, training yourself to do it every day, not just coming for a Saturday, Saturday session for one hour and then you can get all these temporal benefits. So it is up to you. You are the creator of these benefits, not God. You are the creator of these benefits. Nothing to God giving you that. If God can give you all these benefits, He would have done all these. He would have done so. You don't have to request for it. You are your own God. You create all these. You should create all these. You're capable of creating all this. You should have the confidence of creating all this. You should have the persistency, consistency to create all these. There's no free lunch. You want temporal benefits and you don't work at it, how can you have these benefits? It's easy to talk about it. One action is worth a thousand words. You know, but how much time you do it, you, you assign to it. All right, that's the present temporal benefits. But the Buddha said present temporal benefits are not enough because it, they concern only about this present life. What happens if this life is finished? Everybody has, to, everybody has to die. You only live to 100 years. But if you have this body, if you are still healthy enough, why don't you work towards a futurity of you? Do you know that you have a future? 
not in just this form. This form is a temporal form. This form is just one of you who have been changing forms in every reincarnation. You miss the Chan, one life, Mr. Lee, another life, and you're going to go to the next life? I don't know. In the process of reincarnation, we are suffering. And the Buddha said, meditation can detach yourself from reincarnation, transcend all these sufferings, and get into, for the sake of calling it, nirvana, Buddhahood. There's no good names for it. It's just another, it's just the level where you transcend all these. You don't even need these benefits. These benefits are only for the present life. If you attach to these benefits, you can never let go. Even the benefits you have to let go. But you require these benefits to train yourself. What are these? To reduce mental afflictions regarding your future transcendental benefits, to reduce mental afflictions, to increase samadhi and prajna. Samadhi is your concentration and your contemplation. It's about the mind, the mind training. Prajna, wisdom. Leading the practitioner, that is you, towards the path of enlightenment and finally ending the reincarnation of life and death and reaching nirvana, which is Buddhahood. So with all these present and future benefits, are you not interested in doing it? Or this is just something that you do on a Saturday morning? On a Saturday morning, raining, there's nowhere else to go. The best is to get into a temple to meditate. If it is, too, if it is sunny, you have gone to Stanley Park already. It's a gloomy day. Where else would you spend, would you spend your Saturday morning? Plus, you have a free lunch. You are your own creator. You are your own motivator. Can you not motivate yourself? So, that's the benefits of meditation which we all have to remember. When some people like to look at benefits, when they think about a benefit, yes, I can be benefited from this, then he would do it. And then some people may ask me, well, you talk about all these benefits. How do you know? How do you know we will have all these benefits? How can you justify that we have these benefits? How do I know, being a kindergarten in meditation, uh, a grade one, grade two, how do I know it, it will reduce my stress and free myself from, from symptoms and emotions and give myself confidence to get an A in my examinations and, and reduce all these problems and worries that I have? How do I know? Are there any third-party scientific researchers to tell me that you're telling me the truth? Yes, I have. I'm going to show you something. Researchers on the result of meditation. But I'm just quoting you some examples which you can verify from external sources, other sources. American Psycholo Psychological Association. What do they say? They say, yes, Meditation reduce stress, balance the nervous system activation, balance the hormone level, hormonal levels, increase brain coherence. And they have, all have definitions as to what brain coherence is, what nervous system activation is, what stress is all about. So the American Psychological Association, after conducting researches for many years, they come up with conclusions that yes, Meditation can achieve this. And how about the next association that I can quote? Cardiology, research and practice. The heart, cardiology, research and practice. And also the American Heart Foundation, supported by the government, and they, they've done fantastic scientific researches. And they say, what do they say? They say, reduce depression, fear, anxiety, worries, and increase work efficiency, learning capacity, and increase your memory. 
And also, last but not least, overcome insomnia. Can you sleep at night? Or you, do, you have to take pills to go to sleep. Cardiology research and practice, American Heart Foundation, they, they have conducted researches saying that meditation, consistent meditation, systematic meditation, and doing it right would give you these effects. Next, National Resource Center on ADHD. What is ADHD? Attention Deficiency Hyperactive Disorder. Some children have these. They can't stand still. They have to move all the time. They don't have attention. They have attention deficiency. They cannot pay attention for, for one minute. They have to walk around. So it's attention deficiency. And some children are hyperactive. They gotta, they gotta move all the time. They can't sit still for, for one minute. So the National Resource Center on ADHD, they say, it reduces high blood pressure and heart problems and improved memory. It will finally uh, give you a lot of improvements if you suffer from ADHD. You don't have attention. You don't, your concentration is gone. You're always hyperactive. You always easily get agitated. You know, usually get anger, angry and easily out of control. I have friends uh, who have children suffer from ADHD, and I already mentioned to them meditation help. Uh, when I was talking to them, they say, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." But I did. I never. Sh I never seen them showing up with their children. On the one hand, they were worrying about their children. On the other hand, they just don't do anything about it. Just keep on going to see doctors and uh, just keep on worrying about it. They don't do anything about it from meditation. I, I guess that's, that's karma. So, there are researchers on the results of meditation. And now we have talked about the benefits, the temporal benefits, and the future benefits, and we have talked about all these benefits were supported by researchers of famous foundations and, and organizations. And why don't we summarize now? What are the objectives of meditation? One of the objectives in doing meditation. Let's do a summary. The present and the future also. We don't just consider the future. The objectives are in twofold. Present, lead a happy life as a result of reducing mental afflictions, increasing samadhi, prajna, and elimination of sufferings, which would lead to transcend reincarnation, arrive at nirvana and Buddhahood. That's the ultimate law of infinite life. Some people call infinity, ultimate law of infinite life. You will not get re reincarnated again. You will not be reincarnating again. You will get into, the, we call it nirvana. Future, transcend, transcend life and death reincarnation, that's the future, and attaining nirvana Buddhahood. Now these are the objectives of meditation. If your meditation is just to reduce stress, your objective is too narrow. It's much broader. The objectives are much broader. How to achieve these objectives through meditation? These are the questions. How do we achieve these this objectives? And we say the answer is meditation is about the mind. Uh, so in order to achieve these objectives, we have to know how our mind works. We have to know how our mind works first. Not just when you are told to meditate, just I want to sit here, how to cross my leg, right on left, left on top, and left on, on right, and then you have three adjustments, adjustment to the breath, the body and the mind, and how do you adjust the shoulder, how do you relax yourself. These are just the, the basics. These basics are quite easy to grasp. I can print it on a piece of paper, you just follow them. But you have to know what's behind them the philosophy behind them, the meaning behind them. Meditation is, is about the mind. So in order to achieve your objectives in meditation, you have to know, first of all, how your own mind works. Don't you agree? 
then you know. And in the process of studying the mind, you know not just how your mind works in meditation when you are quiet, when you're sitting here, you also know how your mind works when you're outside, when you're doing work, when you are interacting with other people, when you are interacting in your daily life, how, how does your mind work? And when you know how your mind works, then you know how the minds of all others work. And if you know how the general mind works, it will help you in your daily lives. It will help you in your personal relationship. Because in your, in your daily life, you just don't care about how people's mind works. I only care about my mind. Why do I have to care about how your mind works? You know, I only care about myself. But in the process of studying consciousness, you know not only on how you, your mind works, considering yourself, you also know how other minds work. That means what? You're one with them. Your mind is at one with all the others. And we're talking about, when we're talking about positive thinking, motivation, if your mind works in conjunction, in collaborations with other minds, in harmony with other minds, whatever you're doing, you'll be successful in it. You'll be leading a happy family, you'll be having a good job, you'll be leading a happy life. Now we know that meditation is about the mind. I want to still talk about one more slide, and it's a simple slide before we go. How does our consciousness work? How does our mind work generally? We have to know that before we study psychology, before we study consciousness. So we have sensory organs. Do we have sensory organs? We have the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, these are the sensory organs that we have. Basically, we have six sensory organs, including the brain. The eyes, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain. So we have six sensory organs. And when these six sensory organs <clears throat> interact with objects, then what happens? When our sensory organs interact with the outside world, when the eye sees matter, when the ears listen to sound, when the nose smells, when the tongue tastes, when the body touch, and when the brain works and think about various other things, what happened? In the process, in this process, what happened? Consciousnesses arise. Only when you have the right interaction, when you pay attention. So in other words, if I look at you, if my mind is somewhere else, absolutely not in here, if my eyes look at you, I still don't know you. If my tongue is tasting food that I'm so grief-stricken, I'm thinking of other things, even though my, my tongue is chewing on something delicious, I don't know the deliciousness of this because I don't have the interaction. There's no consciousness arises. Only when you pay attention, when you have interaction, then consciousness arises. So what happens when, when consciousness arises? When consciousness arises, what happens? There are some concurrent mental functions work in your brain to induce you to do what? To attach to the objects. You hate that man. You hate that sound. You hate this food. You don't like this touch. So you have an attachment. You cling to things. You attach to gain things. When your concurrent mental functions of greediness, hatred, depression, jealousy, anxiety, fear work together with this kind of interaction, the consciousness, you start to attach to external, ex externalities. You may not know about it. Your anger comes, you may not know about it. Your greed, your sadness, your depression comes, you may not about, know about it. You attach to the alcohol. You don't know the detrimental effects of it, you just want to drink. You attach to the alcoholic content, you attach to, to your memory about the alcohol, how good it is. You attach to, 
to, um, to the computer games that you're playing. You forget about how much time you have wasted. I just want to attach these games. I, w I just want to see this kind of, listen to this kind of music. I want to see whatever is in the iPad and you attach to it. You don't, you don't, you don't know about it. You just attach to it, to drugs, to <laughs> whatever it comes, whatever you attach to, okay? And your consciousness, you know that, depends on your sensory organs. So if you don't have eyes, you don't have eye consciousness. If you don't have nose, you don't have nose consciousness. If you don't have ears, you don't have ear consciousness. Your eyes, ears, and nose interact with the, your matter, sound, smell, and eyes consciousness, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, all this consciousness exists. Now, based on this diagram, you always put that in your mind. Then you know generally how consciousness works. Then you know how much you appreciate the normal function of your consciousness. And I'm always 10 minutes behind. I want to talk more, but I cannot. Ask questions at lunchtime. Okay, about this.